Dr. Bonnie Nish, Executive Director of We're Vancouver. I want to welcome you to our first ever hybrid festival. We're thrilled this year to be back in person after two long years of being online. We're hopeful that you're going to find the diverse programming that we've set out for you be something that you can find something of enjoyment, something that will educate you, something you can have fun with, bring your family to, bring a book to, and wander around and meet all kinds of authors. We want to also take a moment to thank all those sponsors who make this possible every year. The Canada Arts Council, Canada Book Fund, Canada Periodical Fund, Canada Heritage Fund, BC Gaming, Joseph Walks Foundation, the Hamvin Foundation, DVBIA, and so many more. We also want to thank Penguin Random House for coming on board to make sure that we could have ASL interpreters on site this year as well. Please stop by, bring a book, find a book, say hello, and enjoy the day. Hi there, my name is Dave Seaweed and I'm the Indigenous Coordinator at Douglas College. I am from the Kwakutl Nation, born and raised in East Vancouver. My father and his father before him are from Port Hardy in Alert Bay. I would like to acknowledge that I'm sharing with you today on the Kakite First Nation, which is the newest minster band, and thank Chief Rhonda Larrabee for supporting our work at Douglas College. As is my understanding, the word Vancouver Festival spread throughout the Lower Mainland and Fraser Valley and online throughout North America and beyond. I would also acknowledge the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, Kwantlen, Katsi, and Quiquitlam nations. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, where we live, we learn, we play, and we do our work. 95% of British Columbia, including Vancouver, is on unceded traditional First Nations territory. Unceded means that First Nations people never ceded or legally signed away their lands or gave them away to the Crown or to Canada. I have been asked why we acknowledge First Nations territory. Many organizations, governments, and school districts have adopted the practice of acknowledging traditional territories as a way to honor and show respect to the Aboriginal inhabitants of this land, the First Peoples. This practice enables wider municipal communities to share in Aboriginal cultures and leads to better relationships and understandings. Observing this practice connects participants with the traditional territory and provides a welcoming atmosphere to the land where people are gathering. We believe that acknowledging territory is a positive step towards reconciliation, which involves a commitment to learning about and understanding the real history of Canada's Aboriginal peoples and taking responsibility for reconciliation with Aboriginal peoples in Canada. The process of reconciliation is tied to the federal government's relationship with Indigenous peoples. The term has come to describe attempts made by individuals and institutions to raise awareness about colonization and its ongoing effects on Indigenous peoples. I would encourage you all, young and old, to do a little research about where you live, work, or go to school, and in turn, Find out what First Nations territory you are on so you can acknowledge when asked or for sharing at events. I wanted to conclude by mentioning the September 30th national holiday that began last year as National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th. In First Nations communities, we have been honoring Orange Shirt Day since 2013. The origins for the day come from a story about Phyllis Webstad's experience. She went to the mission for one school year in 73 and 74. She had just turned six years old and lived with her grandmother on the Dog Creek Reserve. They never had very much money, but somehow her grandmother managed to buy her a new outfit to go to the mission school. She remembers going to the store, picking out a shiny orange shirt. It had string laced up in front and was so bright and exciting just like she felt to be going on to school. When she got to the mission, they took away her clothes, including the orange shirt. She never wore it again. She didn't understand why they wouldn't give it back to her. The color orange has always reminded her of that and how her feelings didn't matter, how no one cared and how she felt like she was worth nothing. 
All of the little children were crying and nobody cared. We now wear orange shirts that always say, every child matters. I would encourage you all to wear orange shirts on September 30th and become an ally and partner for First Nations folks dealing with the residential school findings. I'm wishing you all the best during your time with Word Vancouver 2022. Stay strong and stay safe. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to Inner Dialogues. In the next hour, you're going to hear from three fabulous poets and uh, to uh, hear their words. And they, they have written what I've come to think of as memoirs in poetic form. You're going to experience all the intensity, compression, the mystery, the wonderment, and the sorrow uh, that, that poetry, uh, that can be shared through poetry. Uh, so I'd like to uh, welcome you to um, express your appreciation uh, in the, in the uh, comment section. Uh, you won't have access to your camera or your mic, but your voice can still be part of this event through, through that comment section. And um, yeah, so as well, just a reminder that without you, this free festival cannot, cannot happen. So if you could make a donation via the link in the chat, that would be great. And uh, we can say a little bit more about other opportunities for contributing to Word Vancouver uh, at the end. But for now, I would like to welcome our first poet of three. Uh, today, we're going to be hearing from Alan Hill, uh, Shani Mutu and Jude Neal. And uh, Alan is in Vancouver. Uh, Jude Neal is joining us from Greece. Uh, and Shani Mutu is joining us from Ontario. If you'd like to put your name in the chat and say where you're joining us from, that would be great too. So again, welcome everyone. And now uh, especially warm welcome to Alan Hill. Alan Hill was born in the UK and immigrated to Canada in 2005. He is the former Poet Laureate of the City of New Westminster, BC, from 2017 to 2020. He is the former President of the Royal City Literary Arts Society and was the editor and curator of A Poetry of Place, Journeys Across New Westminster, published in partnership with New Westminster Art Services. His writing has been published both in Canada and internationally. His latest book, In the Blood, was published by Caitlin Press in 2022. So welcome, Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jan. It's just it's a wonderful welcome, wonderful introduction. And yes, I'm in New Westminster on the unceded territory of the Kukite. So it's just a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to read from my book, um, as Leanne mentioned, called In the Blood, uh, poems of, of recollection and uh, poems about mental health, wellness, poems really about family. Uh, it's kind of, a, kind of a memoir with some poetic uh, license in some ways, you know. Um, this one's called Eating My Own Heart for Christopher Hill, who's my brother. Overwhelm me, brother. Obsess me. Make me you. Now that would be love. I would, I would need to kill you for that. Take an axe to your double bind. See it triple bind in that silent forest at the beginning of us. The start of humankind. It's tight fingered blood curled in the ear of first light seen by nobody. That is who we are. We are the sharing of all you have. The needles, tablets, the half room rooming houses of the strapped down normality you're allowed to be. All your death, which is nothing but mine that I cannot live without. You and I together, trapped beneath the tree that fell, that could not be heard. That is crushing us with the hardness of love, bedding us on the sharpened points of Eden. Thank you. And uh, this was called Inheritance. It's just really about growing up with a brother with mental health issues. He had brain damage at birth and then mental health issues. And how that becomes an inheritance in a way, something that then becomes part of your family history and uh, something you all kind of take on in your own ways as family members. Inheritance. In this 
It is this illness of the mind that has farmed me to the outer acreages of loss. Trapped me in a freak show of continuous fresh starts, I've applied an anxiety to my life with the dedication of a madman. This is because I am one. I've baby-gated every thought, surround-wrapped, sealed or beauty. I must protect myself, not to become myself. All this insanity to appear sane, stay unnoticed, stay undercover, plan a perfect rebirth that will not come, the uncontrollable play at being in control. All that time wasted talking to doctors I do not like about how much I do not, I do not like myself, writing out checks in consultation rooms studded with Buddhas. Then I tell myself the lie that I've gained. Illnesses made me bigger, better, made me compassionate, class-free and advocate. That there are others that have gone beyond words, cannot be reached. But not me, no, not me. That will never be me. Spent a little time in my childhood at times, visiting my brother in, in an institution which was a bit like uh, well, it's a bit old, big old Victorian institution, a bit like the ones used to have in Coquitlam here, or all over, all over Canada. We had them all over the UK, of course. Same sort of model. This one's called the Asylum Visit, an inverted Victorian castle made to keep in, not out. My mother efficiently shuttled, shuffled me through identical, identical corridors, slipped in through security doors onto the ward, past anonymous doctors and crumpled whites. Those little worker ants with delusions of grandeur or clipboard attitude smudgy glasses who never seem to see you move through you in a reptilian slip. Here was milky cold coffee, a rainbow of medication. The poor, the terminal, the chronic, my elder brother perched silently over a plate of beans. Then the slippers. That is what I wanted to see. Pandas, sharks, hippos lined in their largactyl parade. Garfield's a Kermit, a foxhead, rooted on curdled linoleum. That was for me. How I envied them, their exotic footwear, as my mother sat in silence, waited for time to be up. Cigarettes burnt down onto carbuncled knuckles. Nobody moved. I'm going to read this one. Uh, it's called The Hospital Dance. It's about visiting... Um, well, it's about... The, the social events in in those big hospitals that used to happen uh, you know, the, on, a, on a Saturday night. And I worked in a, as a young man, I worked in an institution for, it was largely for autistics, people on the, on the, on the, you know, expect on the spectrum. And uh, we would have a, a party on a Saturday night. It's like Coke and chips and uh, badly scratched records, you know, that people had donated. So it's kind of about that. It's called the hospital dance. On Saturday night, they came in ones and twos from their tiny rooms. For coke and chips, they inch themselves out on the, onto the skin-thin hardwood, shimmy between the flakes of peeled plaster, dropped from uncleanably high ceilings. They came to dance, move themselves to a squat bomb of antique record player that's unstably vibrated on the glass top table. As I spun old 45s, donated by concerned relatives, picked up at thrift stores, Middles missing from their jukebox days, from the days when people once paid to listen. They would have meant something for more people more solid than us, to those that had edges, boundaries, dreams they could leave behind, had jobs, shadows that disappeared when they woke. Well, we have their music now, for a while, a little bit of them as well. Most of us danced on our own, stretched and fashionable knitwear, Yesterday's genes became lost in our own moves, disjointed as we uncoupled our bodies to the beat, worked on being invisible, becoming furniture in dim-lit corners. That night a girl with smudgy glasses danced with the banisters, a teen with wispy beard clapped in a corner nobody touched. In fact, nobody ever did touch, not here, where surviving in your own body was enough, knowing it was still there, still moving, however out of step to your commands. Thank you. And um, I can find it. Uh, let's read you this one. Oh, this is one I quite like reading. It's about, obviously, with someone who's become ill and, and uh, of any illness, I suppose, really, of, of, especially when they're younger, 
it's kind of well, what could have been? What who could they have been? Uh, you think about the anyone, you know, even a child being ill, really. You, you know, it's it's you think uh, in a in a serious way. What could they have been? What what would their life have been if this hadn't happened? So this is kind of about that. It's called the applicants. It was not my brother's illness that became us, but all those people that he could have been. Any time of day or night, a fireman tapped out hellos upon the kitchen window panes. Bankers whispered through the letterbox. On weekends, an accountant standing to attention by the plum tree. A doctor looking bored upon the garden wall. Even the failures of whom we could have been, street sweepers, broken shoe gamblers, poets, would occasionally be at the letterbox, firing resumes, begging notes, staged photographs, photocopies of degrees and diplomas onto the mat. Soon every room was full. We moved to a new house, but the old house followed us. We took disguises and we moved from something, someone, anything. My brother, my brother dragged cor corpses behind him from room to room, often still recognisable as him. I'm just going to mute a minute. I've got to ask my son to let the dog out. Whining. Thank you. A bit of shouting up the stairs to let my uh, get my son to let the uh, dog out the back door. She's making a big fuss. So um, I'm going to read one more for now. I think I'm getting through my time. Uh, great. And then the dog's going nuts, huh? Okay, this is a poem about discovering wellness through, like a lot of us do, through kind of exercise, getting out in nature. It's called Delivery by Foot. I run beyond the last house lights, people beyond the prison site, red, green Christmas lights, onto the loose gravel, dog leg track into the valley bottom. There is just enough moon to guide me, enough fear, tinged with relief, to pull me on forward into the dark. I know that I'm lucky to have them, the people in my life that love me, a practical, loving wife, good kids, that they are what saves me, keeps me intact. There are these moments when I need to be alone, breathe out the confusion, fear, know what it's like to leave myself behind, leave the wallet, keys, licenses of myself, my official being, know nothing but my breath, the pump of my blood, that there is a measure of control over what can never be controlled. Thank you. I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, yeah, Buttercup um, is making a big fuss there, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alan. And no worries about Buttercup. Yeah, yeah, it was fine. <laughs> I'm sure she likes my poet. I'm sure she's just... Yeah. Yeah, making the fuss in just the delight, delight. I'm sure that's what it I'm is. I'm sure, absolutely. <laughs> and and I I have to say it's it's wonderful to hear you read again. I had the opportunity to hear you read uh, in Victoria last. Thank week. you. I know that's wonderful. It was a wonderful evening. It was lovely yeah. chatting to to you and your husband afterwards as well. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It was good to get to know you. And and I have to say that I I found your your reading then and now this time from this book. Um, kind of quietly devastating on, on one level, you know, it, it's powerful. It illuminates, I think, a personal story, but one that's also shared by, by many individuals and families. And, and it's a brave collection. And, and I just can't thank you enough for this, for this work, Alan. Um, and you read Delivery by Foot, which what is one of the poems that really resonate, resonates with me. And I was going to even ask you a, a question about it. Oh. Um, in the poem, you, you, you mentioned the moments where you say, I need to be alone. And, and I, I, it made me curious about, you know, whether poetry is a kind of aloneness as well, or, and, and how is poetry part of your journey? Just in, in what ways has it become part of that? Oh, uh, absolutely part of my journey. I didn't really start writing until my 30s, really, when I was in, I uh, spent two years living in Africa when, in the days really before internet and and uh, i realized i needed a way of processing stuff also i needed to give myself a chance to be able to process stuff and and poetry was a way of doing that i could not i'd never be i was always far too lazy and disorganized to keep a journal and then uh, 
and my journal entries would probably be far too disinteresting you know it's what i have for breakfast so i thought i'd try and create something artistic at the same time mm -hmm. explore my thoughts and feelings but do it in a way where maybe i could create some art that i could share with other people at the same time you know yeah mm -hmm. yeah and it is part of my yeah very much part of my journey yeah and um what i've discovered as i got older i think is I'm an extrovert introvert. I love, I need those moments of aloneness and, and poetry can really help me in those moments. Uh, but I also need people and conversation. I've always had that, tried to keep that balance of the two. And it's, and, uh, you know, I, I, I like to be at parties or, or I like to be alone. I don't like anything else. <laughs> I don't like the in-between stuff, which unfortunately is real, which is real life, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. That again, I I relate very much to that. I always say I am in the the middle of that spectrum of introvert extrovert as well. And and I love the the community that poetry can, oh. can uh, create. Yeah. You know, yeah. for us as as in the planet Earth poetry community. Absolutely. I I got so much out of. I mean, particularly coming from another country to a new country, I got so much out of being part of this community, which. Uh, it's two things. I mean, it's a, it's about allowing us to be ourselves and share who we are and what we feel. But at the same time, I've found in the poetry community, most people incredibly supportive. You know, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's because none of us are going to get rich and famous out of it. There's, there's no point trying to compete with each other to be the next big name in poetry because it's not going to happen. You know, we're just going to trundle along and uh, make our friends and connections and, and, um, do our thing and, and share our art and it's got a pure, because of that it's got a pure art form i think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well I'm, I'm certainly as i said most thankful for what you've shared with us and we're going to hear from you again alan um so thank you uh, all right. So next, we are going to welcome Shani Mutu uh, to read. And uh, Shani is a writer and visual artist. She was born in Ireland, grew up in Trinidad, and moved to Canada in her early 20s. She's the author of two poetry books, The Predicament of Orr, and her latest, Cain Fire. She's the author of several novels, including Polar Vortex, finalist for the 2020 Scotiabank Giller Prize, and the acclaimed Serious Blooms at Night, now a Penguin modern classic. Shani Mutu is the recipient of a Dr. James Duggan's Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Award and has been awarded an Honorary Doctorate of Letters from Western University. She lives in South Southern Ontario, uh, from where she joins us today. Welcome, Shani. Thanks a lot, Leanne. I really enjoyed that conversation with you and Alan just now. And I have to say that the land acknowledgement at the very beginning of this uh, this program was was very moving and one of the most meaningful, probably the most meaningful land acknowledgement I've ever heard. Um, I live on um, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee peoples, and we're quite um, just next door to the Mohawk uh, territory of um, Tayendinaga. Um, I'm going to read um, from Cane Fire, and uh, these poems are... Um, they sort of span periods of my life and uh, starting from very, very young. So this one is from very young memory from when I was just a little kid um, looking out between the plants uh, of my grandparents' home onto the street. It's called Veranda. From city eaves dangled jack spaniards, papery nests, like schoolboys tomb tests crumpled tossed and caught in the black painted wrought iron garden that rose above rows of pots of curly leafed bread and cheese begonia lushly fringing the wraparound black ledged veranda and though your belly was full of cake and milk you pressed each shell pink pillow of begonia for a soupçon smear of yolk yellow citrus sour and waited. And as you waited, you contemplated mechanics of de-stinging, principles of taming, red-bellied, yellow-banded Jack Spaniards. 
Then slowly, below begins the babbling and the flow. You crouch behind your potted jungle and watch. The charm of girls in green skirts and white blouses glimmer through the latticed doors of a white-walled madrasa whose golden star and crescent moon shine brighter than heaven's own stars and earth's own moon. And you marvel at how hummingbirds know why the musin sings and why at this time on the street below white-capped men in white dresses flow. I'm going to read now um, a poem called um, Legacy. When I was very, again, very young, uh, the, my, my mother's brother, Uncle Ralph, was uh, a, a fixture in my grandparents' house. I mean, he had his own house, but he would come over and he was so dashing, so handsome. He was like the the leading men in the Indian movies that my grandfather used to take me to see. And he, when he dressed up, he would wear a cummerbund, which is the, um, the, the broad waist sash. It's usually um, pleated and worn with a tuxedo. And this is called Legacy. It's about the origins of the cummerbund. Cummerbund, wound and wound about the waist, multitasking sash, essential of the Indian man, flamboyant quotidian, brow mopper, money holder, grocery letter carrier, pants singer, dagger hider. In translation, stationed in India, British army man's borrow theft, cummerbund. Close, yes, and best with a cigar. Heat mitigator, Attribute enhancer, camouflage of imperfections in the aspiring man. Conceals unflatterables, tuxedo shirts, bunching buttons, wobbly bellies, rolling bands, too tight trousers. Its upturned pleats from artless lips, indiscretions catch, and secrets, le legitimate, certainly illicit, calling cards. And to explain. With pride and hilarity, my great-grandmother's white skin, this one line, great-grandmother, married to one Mr. Mathura, was the British estate owner's concubine. And true or false? A minor detail. Kamar Bandid Mathura, with his bibi, crossed the Kalapani from his namesake province in Uttar Pradesh, birthplace of monsoon cloud blue, Lord Krishna, where men like Mathura and women like my great-grandmother, stars in their honeyed eyes, are straight-nosed, poised, and pale. Long preceding any goddamn cross the Kalapani estate owner. True or false? At formal dinners and dances, Bibi's Trinidad-born grandson, outshone imperialist proprietorship of the ladder-climbed cummerbund. Does a photo even exist of rotundo, rotundus, rotund, stout yet lean, Uncle Ralph, Indo-Trinidadian pantheon, not smiling? I, knee-high to a fly, from the arched veranda observed, single-button jacket, dinner jacket black, Silk lapels, bow tie to match, shirt, bright, bright light exuding white, silky black stockings and mirror black shoes, wavy hair, patent black, forehead garnished with provocative curl. Before getting behind the burled wheel of his burgundy jaguar, starboy ring adorned hand, smoothened upward the pleats of his elevated Mathura city in the state of Uttar Pradesh waistband. On leather heels, honey-eyed he spun, and voila, a flash of dash, burgundy velvet silk cummerbund. And the last one that I'm going to read is um, an excerpt, actually, from the long poem in the middle of the book. And this poem is called um, 
the crick in the crack. And you can say that this poem is, it's about the tricky question in general of belonging. Time was crick. A set of encyclopedia equals the weight of a human heart and magically quells the forever loading gun. A to Z, Z to A. Zygophylum, genus of the monogynia order, belonging, but be, belonging, 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 belonging to the decandria class of plants. A, the name of several rivers in various parts of the big wide world. Crack. A conch shell to my ear to hear nothing but the outermost, most rare crack. On repeat, oh, very young, taught, taunted before I'd barely begun. I'll only be dancing for a short while. So run faster than a cheetah, high, 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 higher than Rappel's vulture. Like a butterfly, I beat back gale force winds and listen for her voice. It is she, isn't it, who screams on repeat. Where are you now, my son? Crack. The crick and the crack of that anterior fontanelle. Despite, despite how it had all begun, promises my mother has always been looking for me. But couldn't always see. I was, I am her boy who every day walked, walks, ran, runs, flew, flies across muddy battlefields upon which we once were, are forced to lie. Crick, crack. In Barbados, your leg tucked between mine when the tide, the frilly spitting waves and only shells kelp-like you swayed, salt, tug and pull the gentle slam how strange to hold your hand, certain as moon and sun, that seventh wave, the sea birthing water folded in on itself, angled holes appeared in the shoals, I lost my shoe, grasped your hand as if it were breath, and anchored my heels into the sliding sand, crack, crick, and I was, am, the girl she couldn't see, rafting up and down rivers far from her and home, who I could and couldn't without her be, explorer of the how and what I like to do and have done to me. No matter how far I'd roam, no matter how long from home, I am the girl she didn't see, casting petals around her feet. Crack. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. Oh my goodness, that is truly a very transporting reading. Uh, and and I, I want to say how rich I, I found your book to be a, a full body experience, I think I have to say, um, in, in the way that it, it captures um, how memory operates, the connections evoked by the senses, the, the multimedia aspects of it. And I, so, you know, clear what what are the the um, the things that you capture so vividly? Uh, that world of childhood that 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 you know is sometimes hard for us to to reach in in such um in, in in such an intense way that you have in this book. And I was thinking about the poem Veranda, and the sense of wonderment and sort of fluidity of being in the world in in childhood, and and wondered about your process of reconnecting with that state or connecting, who knows, uh, maybe, or, or remaining connected, I don't know. But, but I'm so very curious about how you, how that came about maybe in, in some of the earlier drafts, you know, and, and in writing poetry, that, that sense of that, like I said, that vivid sense of the, <laughs> the world the, the, of childhood. Yes. Well, you know, um, it's the tor the tortured artist uh, syndrome, I think. 
<laughs> where, um, you know, like the happiest time of my life, I think, was in fact until I was six years old when I lived with my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so you might notice that the, and, and for some, I think perhaps for that reason, I have an incredibly and unusually strong memory. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but memory is kind of funny because, you know, once you begin to write down things, then what you remember is what you have written down. And um, I, so then, so then it moves from memory to what works in the writing. And um, I kind of um, enjoy being able to um, uh hold on especially as I, I as i get older it's almost as as i get older there's more urgency to record these very early memories and to remember what things smelled like what they um what they looked like and you know the, um writing poetry is very very good for this reason because there are such huge gaps in the memory that um poetry can stand those gaps and almost um supports those gaps you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I one of the the uh, reviews that I read of your book, um, comment by Madhur Anand, really stood out to me. She called it an anti-history, and so I just wondered if you would talk about some of the con the conventions, the received or hegemonic, you know, histories that you are. Are resisting, you know, in in this book, and and again, it just that process in writing itself. Mm, I'm not really. I like the idea that it's an anti-history um, sort of um, thing, but I'm not sure what um, <laughs> Mother meant by that. Maybe what she means is the um, the conflation. I think, like, or is it possible the conflation of the um, of the um, the um ways that I might have worked with images and also um uh with the poetry and storytelling and so on. So it's not a very straightforward um poetry book. Though, though, though you know poetry can be so many, many things that um I don't think that it is all that hmm. hmm. Ask me another question. <laughs> Absolutely. Ask me to interpret. Fair, fair enough. Um, okay. Well, I I wish so so much for for the the audience to be able to see the your your book that in, in which you use space and visual imagery. Um, you know, the, there are photographs of works of art. There are different fonts. Oh my goodness, the different fonts and the layout. Yeah. Thank you. On this, this one, you know. Like um, fine white line, barely barely visible in in the gutter, and it's mirrored completely in the gutter. Mm -hmm. And then there are these like other ones with the um the images and you know like yes like that and so yeah yeah. So I was wondering about that. All of that that you brought to this book, how this multiplicity has helped you to to reimagine, recast. Um, personal and family history you know i mean most of the time we stick with just the word or you, you know what i mean but you you you've gone with with these other um art forms and and it's it's so wonderful to see you know how, how they all are are working in concert so just yeah so okay. leanne when i was doing it i was not thinking about these things it's it's mm -hmm. kind of funny it's in in the interviews afterwards you're asked to think about to to, to respond and say why you did these things and uh, when i think about them i i mean i i do think that um the answer that i'm about to give you even though i didn't this is not what i was pursuing when i was writing the work i think that it it, it is meaningful and the, the reason that I can say that it's meaningful is because as I began working as a practicing artist and I began working at a time in Vancouver, actually, when there was a lot of, um, you, you know, um, we, we were sort of just getting into the whole identity politics and art and so on. And I think that has stayed with me and how I work 
um, I think talks about my several different identities. And I, I keep challenging those things in the writing, whether it's in the, um, in the prose or in my visual art, my photography, and in the poetry, and trying to say that I, I am not this, I am not that. Therefore, one kind of writing, one kind of art making, it's not going to work for me. And the best, the best thing to do is to um, smash them all up in one space, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. I did that for me better than any of the other works that I've done so far, actually. Yeah, wonderful answer. Thank you so much. And thank you for again for your reading, Shani. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be part of this. Okay, well, next we're going to welcome Jude Neal. And Jude is a Canadian poet, a vocalist, spoken word performer, and mentor who publishes frequently in journals, anthologies, and e zines. She has been shortlisted, highly commended, and a finalist for many national and international competitions. And she's written 11 books. She's joining us today, as I mentioned, from Greece. We've had a few hiccups with, with the technological part of her joining us. We're hoping everything's going to go through through smoothly at this point. So welcome, Jude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leanne. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I, yeah, we can hear you. You're coming through clear. Oh, clear. Yeah. Okay. So um, is it okay if I just begin? Yeah, please do. The River Answers is from the book, The River Answers. And uh, this poem is about my grandmother. I would pin your memory to the river, Nana, to make you stay. You flash your quick silver smile at the camera, but what did you see beyond the lands? Were the mountains spruce blue? and the water roiling at the confluence. Did you stop to see the dragonfly hover over the rock? Then lift off a blur of cobalt and green. Did your tongue gladden at the small wild berries that filled the bushes with a glazed purple hue? Did you gasp at the sound of your own velvet voice, returning back and back again from canyons above. Did you smell the coming of the quenching rain which soothed the sweltering heat of a July afternoon in the Rockies? You were sap happy in summer grateful for the abundant possibilities laid before you at your table of plenty. The river remembers me standing behind you, following your life like a map. Teddy Bear's Picnic. My bear was named Max for short. He saw a lot. He saw my twin spit in my face because that was his sibilant language. And he didn't flinch when the lights went out like me. My bear didn't care if I failed, cheated or lied. He knew why. He saw how scared I was when I tucked into his neck my bear talked he told me i was brave he told me love was simple that it always comes down to yes or no my bear forgave me when i remained silent showed me how to become invisible and leave no mark his amber eyes followed the shadows and bore witness to the chaotic course I was on. When I wasn't sure what childhood was, my bare Max held up the mirror.
when John Prime died on April 7th, 2020 from COVID, I was moved to write a sort of a lyric poem, a poem, a rhyming poem in honor of him, and it's called Something to Say, a tribute to John Prime. When I heard John Prime sing souvenirs in my kitchen that way, I cried on the chair, gulping great tears, for he'd seen inside me, though I I had nothing to say. He could stroke the wrist of the common man and turn his gaze to the heart, find the girl in the diner eating alone just after she'd fallen apart. He could prod you to feel her husband's blank stare wasn't directed at anyone there, and he'd just given up and left her alone, not stroking her beautiful hair. He'd say in that way that was his alone, things that were ever found in the news. He captured the sweetness of long summer days in the tune of his steel string blues. He could make you look deeply into the eyes of the broken who wait to be found in the night and there was no one to see and no one to care, until John sang and switched on the light. So let's raise a glass to the wretched and one to the life we must lead. For you pluck the heart strings of the many who sang along with your song, then could see. The beautiful truth of you. So much pain in me some days that I leak like a rain barrel into ground that is cracked and worn by the fist of loss. How can I soothe this sore heart that relentlessly beats even when I turn my face to the wall, mind caked with grief? Where are you now? My darling boy, do you keep the words close that I sprayed through the phone, arrows aimed at the timeless weight of loving? The sky never blinks. He witnesses the fine thread leading me to the beautiful truth of you. The bowl. The salad bowl he made me needed a silken touch. I liked to stroke its curves and hollows where his hand had patiently sanded the golden wood, smooth as ice. He coaxed out the swirls and traces of growth and rebirth. His offering held the secrets of oranges, cradling their scent and born. I oiled it carefully, moving the cloth round and round the polished grain. He gave it to me as a gift one Christmas, and I couldn't hold back my tears. He said, my love is a circle, never ending. You are the nest I return to when I'm leaning into the dark. His hands carved from a block of teak the form of a bowl, and from it he filled the brimming vessel that was me. The bird. I've been wondering what causes a hummingbird to hover just on the edge of the blaze of geranium, so sure of flight. Do they flirt with the air so they can become a weightless antidote to fear? I have seen the flash of the wings when they suddenly reverse into the crimson petunia. They hang suspended, drinking deeply 
who went after. What does red taste like? Does it cause their little hearts to beat and to break into a thousand glittering shards? I've watched them sleep within the Japonica bush. What do they dream of? Is it a shaft of light on their breast? and their riffle of a breeze, or the moment reflecting that the secret of flight. Oh, bird, you do nothing but trail beauty behind you like a prayer flag. Where we stood. They gathered and sang one song, then left it in corners and beside the chairs, on the tables, and under eider downs, on the window ledges, and in each other. How could they have known the secrets that live in that space behind the knees, that arms as they rise make bones fly, that scars are made of someone else's stories and are seldom the ones you see, that you can kiss the cleft of a baby, just to be the first. And oh, the skin they touched, bathed skin, brown skin, bruised skin, palms and fingers and painted toes. They heard the questions and asked their own, listened to the whispered fears of a blue boy with stones for lungs. A girl in yellow boots clutched the hand of a seven-year-old boy learning the music of thin fires and his own future. They tasted the exotic in Zanzibar, traveled home to Ithaca to find out who they were, walked with hooded priests through forests, lighting the sky on fire, over ice flows, over oceans, over high deserts and fragrant prairies, to back alleys, to sacred places, to their forgotten lives, to the ones they held on to. There were seven part poems, 12 line poems, ones they never reached so far. Story poems, verse poems, stuck poems, and some that teased them and stole their sleep. They looked closely from great distances at cowboys and those who sleep dumpsters, piano players with upside-down music, and a woman with arms strong enough to stir the pot that held them all. They chased black dogs and blonde ones, followed grasshoppers, whales, hummingbirds, stood in quiet communion with the four-point buck, grace on a Sunday morning. They left meaning behind and searched only for the sound, sang their words, found their rhythm, open to the spirit that lives in all poems, a scarlet butterfly rose and lulled them to their rest with the notes of the one great song. And they all abandoned themselves to the last sweet surprise. And my last poem, Reborn, rise again. Do not bow or falter. Ascension isn't a question you ask of the sky. You must own it all, the shadows and the spectacle before you can fly out of your body into the light. Shrug off your torpid lethargy like a shawl. Come with me to the edge of this liminal space. Hold out your hands and rise again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jude. Wow. <laughs>
it was an experience I, I would liken to to listening to a, a vintage Edison uh, radio and hearing your 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 riveting um, poems coming through. There is a little bit of crackle in the background, but we heard your words and thank you so much, Jude, um, for joining us from from Greece. Uh, thank you. <laughs> now it seems a little bit clearer and. Um, although we don't know if we're going to lose you or not. So I think what we could do at this point is I, I would just like to take um, an opportunity to also thank um, all the staff and volunteers at Word Vancouver for making readings like this one possible. There are many other events happening over this next week. So please check out the complete listing at the Word at Word. Uh, Vancouver.ca. And of course, I want to say a word about how you can find these poets' work, their, their books. And the official bookseller of the festival is Iron Dog Books, and you can find their website. Um, maybe we can get a link in the chat for that. Um, yeah. Okay, so, but at any any rate, you can find them, these these wonderful poets and their words again. And I'm, I'm just thinking we have only a few minutes. Um, so what I would do, Jude, is just to ask you um, a question about the musicality of your poetry. And I know I've had the, the pleasure of hearing you perform with a cellist and I know that you're a singer and and I hear the music in your your poetry um, in in many you know through many poetic um, devices but is there a way that you think that you could describe how you bring the musicality into your poetry oh are you still with us Jude oh maybe not Okay, well, we we had the gift of Jude's words. And um, so I think what we'll do is just wrap up for uh, to this session. And um, I wish you all a wonderful rest of the festival. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm.